Hi, welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm David Robson with the University of Illinois, and I'm a, pe a pesticide specialist and a horticulturalist with the Crop Science Department. We have a great show today. We have a lot of experts here to answer your lawn, garden, trees, fruits, vegetables, any type of horticulture gardening questions. And with that, we're going to go with our first guest expert, Doug. Hello everybody, I'm Doug Williams and I will be answering your questions about planting design as well as woody plant care. Um, we have a person who wrote into us questioning us about um, their tulip tree or Liridendron tulipifera. They have a 35 year old tulip tree and they're experiencing a great deal of dieback for the past five years and it's lost several limbs that are up to about three inches in diameter. Um, Based on my assessment, um, tulip trees are very fast growing trees, roughly two feet per year, and they're weak wooded, much like say silver maple. So it may be a fast grower and you get instant impact, beautiful uh, tulip flowers uh, when they are present, and a wonderful golden fall color. However, with the fast growing um, condition of the tree, you also get an early dieback, and it also naturally limbs itself up. So that may be a part of what's happening with this tulip tree. We're also experiencing a previous drought from about two or so odd years ago, and then our recent uh, nearly 30 degrees below zero, which doesn't help. So I would say wait till next year, you should see some newer growth, but it will naturally start to limb itself up. And um, from there, I would just wait, and if there are other concerns, um, we'll have to take those at that time. Great, thanks, Doug. Kelly, you are next. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Kelly Alsup, and I am a horticulture educator for University of Illinois Extension. I serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. And my expert, I'm definitely a greenhouse girl. I know a lot about greenhouse crops and tropical plants, but I do have a passion for pest management. And today, I would like to talk to you about a beneficial insect. And we all have seen praying mantis before. Well, what happens is they lay their eggs on shrubs or ornamental grasses, and this would be an egg case right here, and they overwinter this way. In the spring, as soon as it warms up, the egg case will hatch and thousands of little baby praying mantis will be scurrying everywhere. Now, praying mantis are really good to have in your garden. Um, because they will eat some of those bad insects you don't like. And also they're a really good indication of good garden health. So one of the main things that I would like to say is I'm giving you a little leeway not to clean up your garden this fall because sometimes there's overwintering egg cases and for instance, butterfly pupa that may be out there and you leave it throughout the winter and then you go ahead and clean up in the spring after some of them have already hatched. So I'm letting you be a lazy gardener. You don't have to clean up this fall. You can leave it behind for habitat. That's a great idea. Yeah. I'm not going to argue with you on yeah. that. I think, it's, you, I think it's a great idea. You don't have to clean up your garden unless you're growing vegetables. I think Yes, good enough. We'll say the <laughs> vegetables with the bad insects and the bad diseases, yes. those need to be cleaned up. Okay, our last expert is John. Good evening. I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener, and my expertise or the things I like to play with out in the yard are hostas, tomatoes, perennials, tree shrubs, just about anything that grows I, I like. I brought a couple of show and tells. The first one and Dave, you said you had this, mm -hmm. is pumpkin on a stick. This is um, uh, just an ornamental. It, um, I just thought it was interesting this time of the year. You know, Diane probably would like this in her, in her one of her displays or her vases. And, uh, but that was just one I brought in. The other thing I brought was a stuffer tomato. Mm. And a lot of people confuse this. They look at it and they think it's uh, pepper but it's actually a tomato and I cut one open and this is how it looks. Um, it's hollow in the inside and um, 
it's good to stuff with um, rice or leftover spaghetti, whatever, and then you just put it in a microwave, heat it up, and voila, you've got a instant cup. Great meal. Yeah. Yeah. I think the pumpkin on a stick is actually a member of the tomato family as well, and it's not edible. I mean, no, you're not no, going to no, carve no, it. No, it's no. just a nice ornamental right. looking plant. Right. Great. Well, before we go to the phones, let's go to our Did You Know video. Dandelions may seem like weeds, but the flowers and leaves are a good source of vitamin A and C, iron, calcium, and potassium. One cup of dandelion greens provides 7,000 to 13,000 IU of vitamin A. Wow. And you can make good wine out of those as well, too. The flowers. Flowers, absolutely. And at this time of the year, if you wanted to try to control it, now would be the best time mm -hmm. to try to control it because it's translocating all of the food down to the roots. You're going to get the best control. One thing you want to make sure if you're going to eat it that someone hasn't tried to, to you know, to with the pest control it, before because if you do, then you might be getting some toxins. And they're not as tasty in the fall as they are in the spring. <laughs> no. Let's go to line one with a question on fertilizer from Bob. Hi, Bob. Hello. You have a question on fertilizer. Yes, I do. Uh, I'm wanting to know what the best time of, like in the fall, to put the fall fertilizer and do the seeding. Are we talking about turf grass or any just, type no, of... just everyday grass we got. Okay. Thoughts uh -huh. from anybody here? Anywhere uh, from Labor Day through um, first part of November, really, is, is ideal time. And... Like you were saying, perennial weeds if, is a good time to get those weeds out. If you have are needing to to seed, you probably are having uh, weeds grow in there. So um, get that on and uh, seed it and uh, cover it, uh, aerate it. Um, it. Fall is a wonderful time. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for calling. We're going to line two, Mrs. Ahmed on gardenias. Hi. Hi. Yep. Um, I would like to know how to care for the gardenia plant. I do not have a greenhouse, but I'd love to um, care for the tropical plant. I do have other varieties of jasmine and curry plants, and uh, they do survive, but a couple of times I have tried. This year I'm also trying, but I am very really worried that I might kill it again. Okay. How do I care for the gardenia plant? Great. Well, I think, Kelly, you said you were the tropical, subtropical um, person. Definitely. I, I think houseplants, um, most of them are tropicals, can be easy to care for as that, and then sometimes they can be very difficult to get to flower. Um, I would definitely bring it in during the fall and take them out during the spring and let them grow outside. But when you bring them in during the fall, you want to uh, make sure that you are not potting them up. A lot of people try to pot up their uh, house plants in the fall when they're not actively growing, but you would rather do that in the spring when they're actively growing. Another thing is, um, house plants, they like humidity, and you do not have humidity in your homes, especially if you live in Illinois and run the heat. So sometimes just clustering them together or spritzing them with water bottles every day can raise that humidity just a little bit. Uh, when I take care of my house plants, one thing that I um, do is I put fluorescent lights over them. And then a, a second part is I um, never let my roots sit in water. So a lot of people, they have those trays, and I would rather take my plant to the sink, fill it up with the water, and let it drain out. Um, so one of the things that you could do is you could look at the roots and just gently pull the gardenia out of the pot. And if the roots are nice and white and healthy, then you're doing a great job. If the roots are brown, then you need to maybe back off on the watering. Um, some of the things that happens with house plants is people tend to overwater them rather than underwater them. So really wait till they dry. 
Great. Good information. Thank you. Uh, line three, Kate, you have a question about Christmas cactus. Hi, Dave. I miss you on the radio with Gary Scott. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would love to get a Christmas cactus. I just think they were so, would be so pretty. But somebody tells me they're very hard to grow. Thoughts from anybody? I mean, I know two things to make them bloom, but anybody... Uh, as, as far as blooming, I believe it's all light sensitive. That's one. And the other is don't let them, like Kelly was saying, for house plants, you don't want to let them sit in their in water in their roots. They're a succulent, and that's the worst thing you can do. I've I've seen I've come into homes where they're asking why it looks so, and there's water actually not in the tray but all the way sitting up on top, and. And other people I know that have had Christmas cactuses from their great grandmothers, and it's been handed down for generations. So I wouldn't say that they're hard to grow if you follow certain precautions. And besides the light, keep them cool. Keep them that cool. Was, yep. You yep. can get those flower buds if that night temperature yep. gets down to Six. fifty. Well, into the mid fifties, yep. which yep. is tough for most people indoors. But that's one of the best mm -hmm. ways of doing that. Well, could I keep it in the west window? That's, uh, I think you can. I, th I don't see but why she, not, but, but that's going to be the hottest. Right, but she will need, treat it like a poinsettia where you need absolute darkness at night just to make sure that it's going to set those flower buds. Keep it cool, keep it dark at night. Uh, even if it's in the west window, make sure that there's no street light yeah. shining on it because yeah. that'll disrupt it too. Great. Okay. Thank you. Well, time for one more question before we go around again. And Linda has a question on cucumber squash. Linda. Yes, um, it's cucumber and squash vines. Oh, okay. Um, they die about the mid of, middle of July. I get some fruit, and then the uh, vines just start dying. And the leaves get riddled somewhat. I'd like to know what I can do to save it next summer. Thoughts from anybody, Kelly? Um, definitely, um, it could be cucumber beetles with uh, bacterial wilt, or it could be squash bugs. And one of the best ways to take care of those bugs is early detection. Get them early on, because once you see squash bug adults, you've kind of waited mm -hmm. too long. Uh, I have actually been really successful um, uh, promoting uh, row covers with the master gardeners in my three counties. Uh, you put the, you go and you get a row cover and you can find these in any stores and you just cover the crop for the first three or four weeks mm -hmm. when it's really young and when it needs protection from egg laying and early damage. And um, so that can be a really good way. But um, the thing that I always say is, you know, for uh, squash bugs or cucumber beetles is sometimes maybe skip a couple of years on actually growing that crop. And you'll reduce the amount of pests you have. Great. Thank you. Well, we're going to go back to our experts now with some questions that they have. Doug, back to you. <coughs> Well, we have someone who wrote in to us about uh, their apple trees, and their apple trees they've had for a number of years, and they've done quite successful with um, being um, expelled against the side of their garage or a house structure. Um, this particular year, they've pruned them back severely or very hard in March, and this year they noticed that they only had a few of the blossoms to set. Now, they're wondering why they had only a few blossoms or even a few apples and that is probably because of the hard um, pruning that you did, as well as the severe uh, weather we've had this past um, winter season. So I would wait once again um, with most trees and to see what happens next year. Because you've had such success in, in the past, I would imagine you will have that in the future, um, given that weather conditions, and then you will, may not want to severely prune uh, for a number, of, a couple of years, just to see how things happen. So with that, um, that's my advice. That waiting advice is often one of the best things. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Kelly, back to you. Okay, I have a question from a viewer about peonies. All of a sudden, the peonies are in a little bit too much shade, and 
she's starting to get some powdery mildew and um, perhaps some rust problems and she's considering transplanting it to full sun. Definitely transplanting it to full sun is the reason would help get more flowers and um, have a little bit of disease res disease resistance. Because if you, uh, you know, put a plant that w is going to be attacked by powdery mildew in shady conditions, then it, the powdery mildew doesn't quite get a hold in some of the sunny conditions. So I would definitely prune out those powdery mildew leaves and dig it up and divide it. And Dave says to three pink growing tips and then one to two inches shallow. And um, I, another thing that I might do before I transplant it is dip it in a little bit of soap and that might get some of the powdery mildew off. Okay, great. Good advice and peonies right now. Best time to oh, catch yes. plants. Yes, them. right now. Well, Dave, after you're the right. show. After yeah, the show. After the, the tomorrow, show. Yes. if it's warm out. <laughs> yes. yes. John. Okay, I have a question from the viewer, and they have some strange growth. Uh, there's a 40 foot tree in the back of a small garden. Don't know what kind of a tree. Uh, leaf pitcher attached. So I think we have a picture of the, the tree. There is a strange growth on a high percentage of the leaves. Uh, what is it and will it transfer to other plants? I've never seen anything like this. Um, what it is is a hackberry tree. It is hackberry nipple gall and it's not going to hurt the tree this late. Uh, other trees get it, oaks. Um, I have some of it on my maple leaves. Um, so uh, it's really nothing to worry about. Uh, I know you said that you didn't really care if the tree died but hackberry is kind of a nice tree. I would hate to see it. Uh, go but uh, it's really not anything and, and you don't have to do anything don't spray or it's not gonna do anything so great thanks John well before we go back to the calls we're gonna do our mag quiz video the rose beloved of many gardeners is related to a well-known pie ingredient what is it a rhubarb B blackberries C. Pumpkins. B. Blackberries. The rose is related to the blackberry vine. Not only do they share a similar leaf, but the flowers of blackberries are very much like simple roses. Great. Well, we also know that the apples and the cherries and what do we say, the peaches and the mm -hmm. nectarines are also a member of that rose family. So a lot of our fruits mm -hmm. are a member of that rose family. Well, Let's go back to the phones. Jenny, you have a question on roses. Hi. Yes. Yes. Um, my roses have not bloomed for four years. Okay. And I've had a big problem with my hostas. Uh, the variegated hostas are not growing either. They're in a covered area. It's a southern exposure, but they're underneath my house. And um, the roses not bloom for four years. Okay. Well, Doug, roses sound like a landscape plant. They do. Thoughts? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure when you say they're underneath the house. Well, no, they're, they're actually, there's a southern exposure. The hostas are more underneath the, you know, uh, well, you know, I've got, I've, I've got, my condominium is that they, they, they're kind of protected, but they're southern exposure. So they're getting lots of sun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, roses prefer a sunny location. Um, right. I, but my question would be whether or not they're getting a lot of, um, of the runoff or rainwater that's coming off of the roof at that very point. So you may have too much moisture. Um, it should water from the base. Uh, you should water early in the day so that it's dry um, over the evening because once again you have powdery mildew that can form and it's one of the um, uh, symptoms that will uh, impede the growth or the flowering of roses. You may also want to do some fertilizing, um, so look into doing that. I don't know if the soil has been amended um, recently or has it been for a number of years. Look into doing that, um, proning, um, and looking for some newer growth. Um, that's what I would say for the roses. The hostas, um, they usually are pretty tough. I'm surprised that they aren't doing well. Once again, it sounds like it might be a soil issue as well. Um, they don't prefer full sun. Usually um, full shade to partial shade is one of their um, 
preferences. So I would look into making sure they cite it properly. They're, they're also, the variegated ones are less hardy and less, they're just, they just don't have the chlorophyll production that the green ones do. Also, they do like some food, so some compost around there in the spring would probably help too. They may just, they, 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 the nutrients may just not be correct. And going back to the winter that you had said earlier, the winter was tough it was. on some plants and hostas. I'm wondering on those roses, mm -hmm. I'd almost give them one more year and if after they don't bloom for five years in a row, yeah. it's not a really mm -hmm. attractive plant. I think mm -hmm. I'd probably consider getting rid of it. Yeah. That's my thought. Okay, uh, Jim, line five, question on wild violets. Yes, uh, I have uh, uh, what I call wild uh, violets that are taking over my lawn, and I want to know if there's something I can do short of killing it all up and reseeding. Well, I put a patio in my backyard to take care of that, but I don't mm. think that's what he wants. Um, <laughs> Thoughts? Very difficult because, again, you can use uh, broadleaf herbicide on them, especially if it's in the lawn, but again, it's going to take numerous, numerous applications. and. <sighs> I, I've had the, some violets in mine, and the way I got rid of them in an area, and it wasn't a real big area, get on my hands and knees and actually work them out. And it took, even that took a number of times. So it's not easy. It's, it, yeah, we know there's that. no easy answer. We know that. We know that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Line two, a question about marigolds. Rory, go ahead. Hi, this is Rory. Um, I... Uh, I planted marigolds a year ago, and I used Miracle Grow, and they took off. I mean, they were huge. <laughs> it was like they were from outer space. <laughs> okay. And I want to know how should I grow my flowers and make them that robust naturally without Miracle Grow, or are you guys good with Miracle Grow? Well, I mean, a compost is always a good. Uh, way to do that if you're composting your fall leaves, a lot of the uh, cleaning that you're doing right now in the fall, and you're making sure that um, compost is several months old, if not a year, where it actually is broken down, where it is not taking nutrients to become become compost. Uh, oh, so, so my compost should be that old. Right, it should be old enough uh, and uh, broken down to the degree that it is it is not robbing the soil around it of nutrients because compost actually takes nutrients from the soil when it's uh, not ripe or isn't aged old enough. So um, yeah, it should be quite old. Okay. What are your feelings on the medical grow though? Um, it is one of the options. You've had some great results with it. Um, and I imagine if you use it again, you probably will get those results. Um, and there are a number of other uh, fertilizers uh, and you can test them out as you like as well too. And sometimes, uh, especially on vegetables and things, you may not want to use miracle Grow because you'll get that robust growth on some things and no fruit. So I, we get a lot of calls and saying, I've got these big, huge tomato plants or pepper plants, and there's not a single fruit on them. And, and it's kind of like that. It's, you know, you get these wonderful looking plants, but no, no fruit. So depending on what you're wanting to grow, it's, you know, if you're needing nitrogen and uh, to, to grow things, it, it works fine. That is how I use the miracle Grow. is early on in the season um, when I want that fast growth, but then when I want fruits and vegetables, I might go for mm -hmm. a different type of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks for the question. We have time for uh, one more. Jason, line one on tropical milkweed. Uh, hello, uh, I have a question about uh, tropical milkweed. Uh, I've got some in containers and some in the ground and uh, my intention was to move the containers into the garage over the winter, but uh, should I dig the ones in the ground up and do the same thing with those? Kelly? Absolutely, they will not stand going below 50 degrees, they're tropical, and so you could either, if they're producing seed, you could collect a seed, or you could dig them up and put them in a small pot and overwinter them in your uh, house as a house plant. Actually, the tropical milkweed has been proven to um, support more monarchs than our native milkweed, mm -hmm. so it's a great plant to incorporate into your gardens. Great. Well, thank you. We are close to wrapping up. Any last quick comment that people should be doing? 
quick 10 seconds. Enjoy the fall colors. Kelly. Um, definitely, uh, you know, think about maybe planting some garlic next month because garlic can be mm -hmm. a great crop to plant. Get outside and enjoy it. And I would say plant a bunch of bulbs. Uh, make sure that you work the soil well. Just plan on for spring colors. Well, with that, we thank you for joining Mid-American Gardener. Come back next time and enjoy the fall. Happy gardening.